Welcome to the show. This is a Thursday edition, which is usually the day we do it, of my YouTube live show where we talk DevOps, Docker, Kubernetes, all things cloud and containers. And this week, I'm excited because I have my friend Ray on the show, and let's just get right into it. And we'll talk logistics and you know all that stuff once we have some fun. Um, let's see. Good afternoon, Ray. How are you? What is up? How are you doing? Good. Uh, so for everyone who doesn't know you, uh, Ray Venom is actually a part of our team. Uh, we actually used to be neighbors, and now he lives on an island somewhere in the world. So Ray, tell us where you are and a little bit about yourself. I am somewhere in the world, just as you mentioned. I am in St. Thomas, uh, the United States Virgin Islands. I am... Uh, sitting in my living room overlooking the ocean and uh yeah happy to be on the call and so let's um i'm sure people got a lot of questions because uh definitely some people were talking about this earlier and uh you know everyone that's taking my courses or you know really just probably watching this show found it probably because hey they're trying to learn new tech and we're all struggling to learn something new and uh, I thought it would be, you know, actually it was best idea, another member of our team and my wife, she gave us the idea today that why don't we have Ray talking about his experience learning DevOps from a traditional sysadmin background and it. It was a great idea. So I thought, let's change the whole show at the last minute. Let's, uh, let's have Ray on and talk about the, the process of learning, you know, resources and all that kind of stuff. So uh, real quick, give us uh, sort of a, a heads up on what What's your background like? You know, uh, school. What you know? What jobs did you do? What kind of work did you do? That sort of stuff. Yeah, sure. So uh, I got started in IT at uh, Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, I chose uh, IT because I always wanted to work remotely, um, or at least live in a cool place. Uh, I thought that this kind of industry would give me more opportunity to do so. Um, I got my uh, first job out of college doing help desk work um, and you know light sysadmin type stuff uh, at a urgent care company in Virginia Beach and then uh, after that got started with a, um, a, a actual sysadmin job for a financial company uh, in Virginia Beach as well and um, you know I just kind of I wanted to get out a little bit um, felt a little bit cooped up and so I started looking on Craigslist <laughs> for jobs and uh, which is very dangerous. Don't recommend unless you know you're. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this PG. Okay, sure. <laughs> unless uh, you're desperate. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <clears throat> so uh, I got into some um, consultant work uh, that I found on on Craigslist down here, and uh, it you know it was very inconsistent where I, I was working a lot of hours, but only able to bill so much. You know. For uh, for the amount of work you're putting in, which I'm sure you understand with your background in consulting work, um, yeah. And so when you know you were you've been talking to me about Docker since I was you know going through school, and um, and you know when I was like, hey, I think I need to find a new job, you know, you kind of presented me with this. Well, why don't you be our intern for a little while, and you can learn Docker, and you know it'll open up some more career options for you in the future. And it's just been a, a perfect fit for me. So. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm really enjoying where I'm at. Yeah, that's great. Um, of course, you know when you're on the call with your boss, you better say that. But <laughs> yeah, the blink twice if you're in danger. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Give us a sign. Give us a sign. <laughs> so, I mean, there's so much to unpack there and talk about. We could, we probably should save a whole other episode for the idea of like how do you how do you move to a strange place and you know, r get work and find a remote job to work from anywhere. Like, you know, that's, I think for a lot of us, that's the dream, but we're going to save that for a different episode. Cause I think that's a really interesting topic because in tech, we're, we're sort of leading the way in remote work and you're seeing more and more of those jobs now, even at the big companies at Google and Microsoft and all, all these places have remote working teams. And it's a lot of times I, what I hear is the job is like, you can either be here or you can be remote. doesn't really matter. Um, and that's be definitely becoming a, not necessarily the default, but a more common thing in companies that are definitely tech savvy. So, but what I want to talk about is your journey, um, you know, from 
basically, you know, you graduated college, right? And you had yep. these skills, but you probably couldn't directly apply those to a job right away, right? Correct. I went like an inch deep and a mile wide and uh, just didn't really have a whole lot of um, immediately applicable knowledge right out of college. Uh, I felt like I learned more in my first month of work uh, after college than I did my entire um, actual degree, which is another reason why there's so much value in stuff uh, in courses like yours, on, like like Udemy. I mean, I took, uh, you recommended a, uh, an HTML course for like, you know, while I was still in college and and oh, I, I started that. learning this. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I started learning that and I was like, wow, this is a whole new type of thing where it's at my own pace and, um, you know, and if I don't want to learn this, I can just spend another 10 bucks and <laughs> pick something I do want to learn. So I, I got like a lot more uh, saturated knowledge of, of stuff that's actually applicable, you know, after I got out of school. And when I got started with uh, taking the Docker course, um, I was, you know, getting a little bit of the taste of like the future because I was editing um, your node course at the same time. So I'm like hearing all these crazy higher level concepts while I'm still learning about the foundations of the stuff. And, I'm, and I, you know, and that kind of helped because I'm thinking, okay, I just heard a word that I'm recognized. I got to know this. I got to remember this. <laughs> and um, so that helped a little bit. And then once I got a little bit further into the course um, and actually finished Docker Mastery, um, I, uh, you know, I started doing a lot of the, uh, the Q and a, like, so that the questions that students submit on Udemy and in, and in Slack, and that's really helped me a lot because, uh, you know, on the surface it's, I'm answering questions for people, but you know, if, if you look at it from my perspective, a lot of these questions, I don't know the answer to either. So I'm, uh, I'm doing a lot of the research myself at the same time that, you know, the students have questions. So that's kind of helped me um, understand the back end of everything that's going on. So that's where, uh, that's where it's been. And I'm, I'm enjoying uh, soaking up all these different types of learning. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, you know, a very similar story to me in terms of like, I didn't, well, I didn't go to college. I, I joined the U S Navy <laughs> straight out of high school. But um, it, so Basically, a majority, I think for a lot of us, even if you go to college or regardless, a lot of our learning is on the job training or OJT. Yep. And yep. Uh, you came, what, what I consider from a very similar background to myself, and there's lots of ways to get into DevOps. Like there's so many different paths to getting into DevOps, and it doesn't have to be just a sysadmin or just a developer, which are really the two sides of the DevOps dance that we do. But uh, yeah. you came from the same side I did, which was sysadmin. So... Would you say your first job was more of a, a PC support light? Like, oh, yeah. Uh, like, yeah, a lot of desktop stuff. Because that's how I started, right? And, and I was actually doing it yep. on, a, on a ship. <laughs> so I had the fun of, yeah. like, learning how to fight fires in the bowels of a you know, Navy vessel yeah. while also yeah. doing backups on, you know, PCs. Or you know, back in the day, we had floppies. So we were, like, helping people yep. install Word with 25 office floppy disks or whatever. Yeah. So um, yeah. I'm, I'm old, if you can't figure that one out. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I come from that background of like, you know, I, I learned the, 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 the clients basically, you know, back when we were first getting web browsers like you did, learning, you know, yeah. networking problems, stuff like that, then learning servers, and not so much the developer side. And in fact, um, like your HTML course, my intro in the 90s to development was HTML a little bit of CSS and maybe some access database stuff. So it was basically like, how do I make a website? And back then, you know, um, we got lots of cool tech now, but back then, like if you wanted to run a website and you didn't want to want a database server and you wanted to have something in a database, you could use an access database and you can technically still do that today, but no, no one really usually does that. So um, what do you think, uh, what appealed to you about DevOps? So you, you were a sysadmin and you were like, this DevOps stuff sounds yeah. like where I want to be. What were you thinking about when you decided that you wanted to shift? To, why? Like, why did you want to shift that career? I made that career shift um, because, uh, you know, based on how quickly the industry is moving, I was concerned that my skill level at the time uh, was going to be the default for, like, kids coming out of high school. And I was concerned that I was, like, peaking, you know, and, and that um, – 
there wasn't any more growth beyond sysadmin, you know, where um, if I was able to transition more into the uh, into the development side, but still keep the, the same operational type background, um, that I feel like that would have checked off all my boxes. So it was, uh, you know, partly out of um, out of fear of, uh, of becoming obsolete and also partly out of, um, you know, like we were talking about before, living this like fluid lifestyle where I can kind of do whatever I want and go and, you know, be wherever I want to be. And, um, you know, yes, IT offers a lot of that, but specifically in the development side, you know, there, there's such a shortage of, of people with this skill set that, um, you know, a lot of companies want people that know this stuff. So I felt like it would make me uh, even more um, open to options. So it was, yeah. you know, a little bit of both of those. Yeah. And I think that's a good point to make, too, that um, I, um, I think a lot of people that take our courses and, and that I meet that are stepping in or trying to understand DevOps and get more into that realm, um, there's a lot of misconceptions. I think one of them is that DevOps is only for senior people, and that's definitely not yeah. true. I, uh, someone yeah. recently was asking that in the course and saying, yeah, I've been told this, that you know, you, you have to be like an expert at development and then you know, like uh, learn all the system administration stuff, and then you can be DevOps, and that's definitely not true. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think the, you know, your approach of, like you were saying in college, that you learned a little bit about a lot, essentially, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I have these three terms that I learned from a gentleman that I can't remember his name over a decade ago at a conference here in Virginia Beach. Um, and he was talking about the difference between a generalist, a specialist, and a virtualist. So a generalist is kind of what you learned in college, which is I know a little yeah. bit about a lot of things, but yeah. the minute I need to go deep, like troubleshoot something or understand relationships of technologies, I, I lose I, I, I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's a generalist, right? And that's really great as a PC support person or as someone who's like on a call center, right? So they, yeah. they know lots of, they don't know what's coming in at them. It's just random stuff every day. And they know a little bit to help everyone. And then there's yeah. the specialist, which I think is largely what we, you know, uh, have been used to in IT over the years um, is someone is a COBOL programmer or a mainframe programmer or maybe... They are a server, um, like back when I ran servers at the city of Virginia Beach a decade ago, we had a, I had 300 servers on my team. There was two guys that all they did was install servers. Like basically they racked them, they installed the OS, and that, that was the extent of their job. So they were very specialized. And then uh, over the years, we found that because of automation and things get easier and everything wants to go faster, that's the, kind of the theme of DevOps is making everything mm -hmm. go faster. Uh, that that two person team ended up being a one person team, and then it was a, a half time job. Like it it wasn't something that we needed all these people for because everything kept getting easier. And these specialists had a hard time adjusting to other roles because they knew nothing else. Yeah. Now, so I don't. I think that as your career progresses, th that you'll learn that like I did, that the specialist and the generalist are two weak points of IT, whether it's in developer ops or whatever you're doing, right? All of IT, yeah. all of technology. And I think <clears throat> they're true, sort of the person that can sort of make their own path and get their own job, sort of write their own ticket eventually, is someone who, yeah. what this guy defined over a decade ago for me, the virtualist. And the virtualist is someone who becomes a specialist in one area of study for a short amount of time. Let's just pick a number, yeah. six months. So they specialize and focus on that one area tech technology. Maybe it's Docker for six months. And then they move to a new specialist role where they are now maybe focused on continuous integration and testing of code. So maybe they're running Jenkins or uh, Code Deploy or Code Ship or, J or Travis CI or any, any of the thousand tools for CI and CD. Yeah. And so they focus on that. Now they, they're still applying and using their, their, their skills that they had in Docker, but maybe they're learning the CI, CD. And then they, knew, they learn a new role as a specialist. So the thing is they don't go as wide as a generalist, and they don't go as deep as a true multi-year specialist. specialist. And he coined that as a virtualist. And he said that the, that the world, basically, of IT will now be run by virtualists because we can't, we can't just learn one OS. We can't just learn one programming language. Right, most of us aren't lucky enough to just know one cloud. We have to usually know at least a couple of clouds, and um, 
I love that term. So I always talk about how I'm yeah. a virtualist, that I like to go deep in certain layers of technology, but I don't know everything. Uh, like, you know, I machine learning. I've basically ignored most of it till now because I consider it, I don't have to get deep into that. I just know how the infrastructure works. So I, someone asked me about infrastructure, I know the infrastructure side, but I don't know machine learning, even though the internet makes me think that I have to learn machine learning right now or yeah. AI. Like I don't know, you know, the top five programs for running AI because I'm managing and dealing with the infrastructure underneath. So I don't really need to get deep into that. And, yeah. uh, I think that the nice thing is we can all we can all sort of carve our path there. Like you can be a virtualist that maybe has five areas of expertise if you just picked a number. And maybe like for me, if I had to pick pick them, it would probably be like uh, basically anything containers. So it'd be Docker and Kubernetes, and then it would be understanding the CI/CD systems and the CI/CD workflow, understanding the OS is underneath. So I'm I focus on the operating systems and the hardware underneath and like the networking layer. So um, that would be mine, but it doesn't mean that needs to be everyone's. Like, uh, yeah. there's so many jobs out there that expect you to be more on the developer side of DevOps, yeah. not so much the sysadmin side. And so I think that a lot of people are looking for the formula for DevOps, and that just doesn't exist. In fact, yeah. if there was ever a role in all of IT that was not consistent across jobs, it's the it's any it's any job, and I'm guilty of this yeah. too. Any job with the word DevOps in the title. Because DevOps isn't even a technology. DevOps is a yeah. way of thinking. It's a way, yeah. it's about people and process. It's not so much about the tools. And there is no such thing as a DevOps tool. I know we probably even, I might even say that at times, but I'm, yeah. I'm wrong when I say it, right? And th there's yeah. tools that help you implement the DevOps workflows and mindsets, but it's not, it's not truly a DevOps tool. Um, yeah. Anyway, enough of that soapbox rant. So, well, I uh, like... Uh... I like what you were saying about being a virtualist because that's kind of like one of the foundations of of all of what DevOps is, right? Like it's it's removing those uh, like they call them silos, right? So removing the silos of of this is my bit of information that I know, and anything else is somebody else's problem. You know, being a virtualist forces you to uh, to go beyond having that limited scope of information only and being so good at that one thing that anything beyond that is you know inconceivable so being in um involved in like a devops way of thinking forces you to to be that kind of virtuous that you were talking about understanding you know every single part of the of the whole process uh instead of just your one individual sect so yeah yeah i like that and it's definitely a journey right like i i a little, all of us, I think, uh, suffer a little bit from, or at least a lot of us, suffer a little bit from uh, in what they call imposter syndrome, which is where you feel like you're pretending to be something and yeah. other people think that you're something you're not. Um, I think definitely as a speaker and as someone who tends to be a mentor and uh, that that can be a challenge of mine is that people just assume you know everything. Um, yeah. Or at least it seems to sometimes feel that way. And uh, as an intern, it's nice because I, I would hope that you don't feel like you're expected to know everything because yeah. you're, you're been given that sort of um, permission. But what, eventually in your career, people will just assume that you know, you know Jenkins or assume that you know yeah. AWS's database technologies or whatever. And um, yeah. that's, that's true right now, I think, in containers because people, uh, people tend to assume that you understand a lot of the the underpinnings of Kubernetes if you're someone who's at a conference. And uh, yeah. there's a lot to Kubernetes. So the challenge is, I don't think there's, uh, with technology, especially Kubernetes, I don't think there's any one person who knows it all, right? It gets, yeah. There's so much to it. It would be like saying, I have used and know all of the AWS services, and there's dozens and dozens of them. <laughs> so most people yeah. never would operate even half of those services. So yeah. it's a it's a, a world where where now there's a great talk that I saw last year at GoTo in Chicago where the keynoter is someone who he's he is original computing gangster. Like he's been around for <laughs> 30 plus years. Uh he remembers when there was really only two or three languages that anyone wrote. And um he talks about how like back then you could know the whole of computing in back in the early early days right yeah. in 70s yeah and yeah. now you you can know a fraction of a fraction 
and that's that's good enough for, for most jobs. But it's yeah. just you have to realize that you you will there will always be an overwhelming amount of information that you just don't know. Oh yeah, so. absolutely. So and I've I've definitely gone through that like uh, like the imposter syndrome type thing, and you know it's easy to kind of play off like oh well I'm just interning and I'm still learning, but like a lot of it is like. You know, I get a question where it's like, what the heck is going on here? And, and being forced to, you know, uh, learn, like break, break something down into anything. Anything can be Googled, right? You just have right. to know what, what you're looking up. Um, and that's really helped me a lot. And, you know, another, another thing that's helped me is that, is understanding that this whole thing is, is so new, you know, the whole concept of, uh, of DevOps and Docker and containers as a whole, it's, it's relatively new. So a lot of people are, you know, don't really know what's going on and it's okay. You know, you gotta, it, it's a constant learning process for everybody. So that's also helped me out a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I think that the challenge is, is that there is no one recipe for, um, you know, I imagine if you're a construction worker, there's a list of tools and there's a list of processes that you're expected to understand, and everybody knows those. But I think that, uh, especially with DevOps-like positions or positions that are in the DevOps workflow, I'm going to stop calling yeah. them DevOps jobs. Um, <laughs> they, uh, it's a challenge because it, you could. Uh, this is why it's not as important to know all the tools because if you moved from one position in a company to a di to that a similar position in a different company, it could be an entirely different tool set. The goals are the same, the workflow is the same in terms of we have code, we want to test it better, we want to get it into production better, more often and more reliably, and then we want to measure it and improve all of our processes as well as our service to our customers on an ongoing basis, right? So if that's yeah. the that's the base goal of DevOps, you could be in one job where you're using all Microsoft tools and then the next job you're doing that same thing but you're using all open source tools. Like yeah. you could completely transform that and that that's a challenge because if you're a, if you're a hiring manager and you're looking for someone who has this specific set of tools list which is often the case in jobs where we're listing a set of tools I always I tend to disagree with that because you're probably going to be it's, it's going to be very few people on the planet that have your exact list of tool sets, right? Yeah. We are using yeah. AWS, but we're using it with GitLab, and we're using GitLab with um, we're not using it with Docker. We're using it with Red Hat Enterprise Linux eight because that has Podman, right, or whatever. And so you yeah. had this yeah. full tool, tool list, and then you're limiting your audience. So I always approach this stuff from, and I'm hoping that a lot of job managers either are doing this or will eventually do this is I approach it from uh, tell me about your experiences and tell me about how you learn. Because I think that yeah. in all of IT, especially in DevOps and the cloud right now with cloud native, is it's more important how you, how you learn, your, your process of learning, how do you, do you share with the team? Like, you, the, do you share what you learn? How do you share what you learn? Those are actually, I think, way more important fundamental characters of a person that yeah. matter in your success and matter in the success of your team than... Oh, I I know Jenkins backwards and forwards. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So I, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say like um, how you were talking about like the way you learn being of the most importance rather than what you're learning. Like um, back when I was in high school, when they made you learn a uh, a foreign language, like that was part of the uh, requirements. And I know it's it's apples and oranges comparing a foreign language to you know technological te technological concepts but they you know always said like hey once you learn a, a foreign language you know any sort of and you're fluent in that learning a different foreign language is going to be like 10 times easier than just starting from scratch and i think it's the same kind of thing is once you learn what you need to know and how you need to pick it up it's you, you can learn a lot quicker you know so yeah and it makes you like makes you uh you might feel like a specialist, but you you really are becoming a virtualist. So yeah, yeah, that's true. So you're you're a um, a dual lingualist, uh, and, and so like in programming, we have that. It's a a, a what is it? A polyglot, um, learning many languages. And so I think that's just the nature of DevOps is that you have to learn many tools that are the yeah. exact same tools. That's just a part of the job. So um, let let me uh, let me remind the audience here that. Uh, 
put your questions in chat. We're going to be getting to those in here in a few minutes. But yeah. uh, if you can focus this week the questions on, uh, you know, for Ray, right? We got Ray on the show. So uh, learning DevOps, uh, you know, questions for him on his journey to going from sysadmin to a cloud-focused uh, DevOps engineer, uh, stuff like that. So we'll get to those in just a few minutes, but I have a few more questions for Ray. Um, yeah. What, uh, what are, like, if there was a couple of things, if someone came up to you and said, wow, you're, you're learning DevOps, can I, you know, how do I learn that? What would be a couple of ways you'd help them to get started? So I kind of did, uh, I did things a little bit out of order, I feel like. So I got started with um, a DevOps foundation course, and I did that second in my learnings. So I would start with learning just the general idea of DevOps. Um, you know, there's a course on Linda that that you sent to me, which was um, DevOps Foundations, uh, and that was with Ernest. Uh, I can't think of his last name, but uh, uh, yeah, but they they were you know I got it here. I'll yeah. post it. Perfect. Um, so that uh that helped me out with you know. Like I was learning a lot of Docker stuff, and then I went to the uh, DevOps Foundations, which I would recommend going <laughs> different order. Um, and so I started with started there. Uh, and once you get into that course, they go over um, you know CI/CD stuff, um, continuous or, or testing. Uh, they go into um, blue green deployments, that sort of thing. So once you're uh, once you're into seeing this big picture of, of how this whole process works, you can kind of pick what you want, um, what you want to focus on. For me, it was, I needed to learn Docker, um, containers, that sort of thing. And then, um, you know, specific questions in the, in the course. But after the, after learning the foundations, you know, I, I can't recommend Udemy enough with picking a course on there, um, that you like, or that has good ratings and it's 10 bucks with a 30 day money back guarantee. So, like try it out. You have nothing to lose, you know. So um, that, that I would I would recommend picking a an area within uh, the foundations that you like, and then uh, yeah, and then get a get a Udemy course on it because it's you know you most of the time it's beginner to you know uh, intermediate advanced like in one course. So um, that helped me a lot going from foundation to you know, Docker, uh, and I'm not, I wouldn't even call, call myself intermediate advanced. I'm still learning a lot, but, um, but that's how, that's what worked best for me was learning, seeing the big picture and then, uh, being able to pick, pick an area within that to focus on. So, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm showing on the screen now the DevOps course, uh, I gave to you cause I, I, <clears throat> I get this question a lot. So I thought I would sort of research the field and see if I could find a course that, taught the people and the process part, the mindset part yeah. more than the tools. Um, for those of you watching, um, yeah, there's so many courses out there on on DevOps and I'm I'm guilty of this too because it's a keyword for searching that the 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 the, the courses focus on the tools and uh, what you really I think first need is a course that focuses on the why. You know, uh, yep. why do we yep. even need this? How is this different than before? Um, you know, is this really about learning Jenkins and Docker, or is this really about uh, you know understanding the the fact that we're delivering? Uh, you know, essentially, we're a part of the, we're a cog in the machine that's delivering a service to a, a customer, and that customer might be internal or external. Yeah. It might just be our blog, <laughs> and we want yeah. to implement DevOps-like workflows into our blog. Um, and so there's a set of, once you have that mindset, and once you understand the people part and the process part, the tools are sort of the last bit, right? And you yeah. you can use a lot of different tools, and because just, if you, if you were to take a random system administrator or IT pro, and then you give them Jenkins or any CI solution, and you say, okay, go do DevOps with this, they would n they would not fail. I mean, they would not succeed. They would they would struggle to understand why this tool is even needed, what, what yeah. is it for? Um, because th once you realize the core issue is we need to deliver services and, and code at a faster rate, more reliably, 
yeah. that forces you into a way of thinking where you're like, okay, I need a tool to help automate this. I need a tool to make yeah. this easier. Uh, yeah. You know, so yeah, check out that course. I wish I had a coupon for it. I don't, unfortunately. Yeah. It's on uh, LinkedIn yeah. Learning. Um, but yeah, there's okay. a uh, there's a question here from um, Robo Dude six 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 number of the beast. Um, that just to kind of circle back with what we were talking about. I know you. I think you might have had one more question for me, but just to okay. touch on this real quick. So it says, Ray, when it comes to DevOps Docker, what did you find hardest to learn because of lack of available information? Um, I don't. So one of the main tenets of DevOps is they have this acronym CAMS: uh, Culture, Automation, Measurement, and Sharing. So the last one, sharing, is key, right? Like. Uh, Whatever people are learning in this community, a lot of people are posting it, talking about it, um, you know, making videos, asking questions in public forums. So there wasn't a whole lot of stuff where there was lack of information. There was a lot of me not knowing what to look for. Uh, and like I said, when I went from, I started with the uh, Docker Mastery course, which was, you know, uh, that's where I got. I did it was your job, point. so you had to do that. Yeah, one. I had to. <laughs> Um, I had to keep the lights on. And, uh, yeah. so when I got started with that, you know, there was a lot of stuff. I'm like, well, I don't really understand why we like, I didn't really get the benefit of all of it yet. Right. So like I said, learning that the general idea of why this is all happening, um, allowed me to know specifically what to look for. So there's no real, uh, in my experience so far, and I'm, I'm still very new, but in my experience so far, there hasn't been a lot of lack of information. There's there's a ton of information out there, um, and you know, like I said, That's I'm only challenge, right? a little bit. Into, yeah, but you just gotta figure out what you what you're looking for, um, and that's kind of that's more than just a Docker or a DevOps question. That's kind of like a uh, that's a fortune cookie question. You know, it's not it's not that there's the information isn't there. You just have to know what to look for. So it's um. Sounds cliche, but it really, especially in this community, there's a ton of information out there. You just gotta, just gotta know what to look for a little bit. Yeah, and uh, that's a that's a great uh, answer to that question because it is a hard question to answer. And um, one of the things, one of my personal goals for all of this stuff. So if you're watching and you've taken a course or you're on my newsletter or you've received something from me before, um, just know that a lot of what we're we're trying to achieve in this small little team is to create um, essentially a, a an on you know there's lots of places online to learn tools but there is the day-to-day -day grind of you know okay now I've got this tool in my tool bag but I have no idea how these all go together or um, I don't really understand why I even need this or I've got these two tools which one should I really use and there's lots of communities but um, a lot of this stuff is tends to be very focused. Like if you go to Stack Overflow, it's very focused on you have a question, a technical question, and here's a technical answer. And you can't yeah. really have a discussion. You can jump on yeah. the Docker forums or you know some other forums, but those tend to be focused on a particular technology. So if you um, go to my website, and I'm just going to show a couple of resources real quick. One of our goals here, and this is, I guess, the long point I'm getting to, is to eventually have a way and a place for people to get that full understanding from beginning to end. So like if yeah. I could just make courses appear, we would have a DevOps foundation course. We would yeah. have a CI CD course. We would have a monitoring and measuring course. Um, so, and, and that would, we have a whole community around that and that would allow people to start or jump in somewhere in the middle of their journey in the DevOps journey yeah. and uh, both learn what they need to learn and then also help others. Because I would think, um, uh, Ray, you're um, you're just getting started, but yeah. wouldn't you say that the Q and A, like you helping other people, is often one of the easiest ways? Well, it's hard. It's one of the hardest and easiest ways to just learn a lot of things that fill the gaps, right? Because Absolutely. other people are thinking up things that you never thought of, and you're like, I don't even understand this question, but I'm going to help them with the answer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and another, um, you know, you you kind of uh, slowed me down after like a few answers because like I, I was getting so like hell bent on like I have to answer this, right? Like I have to, any problem that they're having, I need to create the solution for it. But 
a, a part, another part of, of DevOps that has helped me and helped, I feel like a lot of students is that I'm not answering questions anymore. A lot of the time I'm like, Hey, look at this and you tell me what's wrong with it. You know what, um, uh, helping people point them in the direction of, uh, allowing them to look for the answer a little bit. So that's been a huge helper in my, in my learning process and, and kind of taking that, uh, almost like a leadership role of like saying, Hey, I know this is like confusing as hell and you don't know what's happening here. I'm only pretending like I do, but, <laughs> but take a look like this, you know, just break it, break it down into smaller problems and yeah. you can learn this for yourself. It's a, uh, any problem that you're having is, a. Uh, a lot of a lot of the students that submit questions answer the question themselves. They um, yeah. and you know and having somebody to to point at and say just take a look at this one particular part right here. You know that that's a uh, a big help for a lot of students and for the teaching assistant and the instructor. So that's been a huge help. Yeah, uh, I'm scrolling through the questions to to look for any more DevOps yeah. stuff before we get to the. Uh, other course-related questions? Because I know a lot of you are here from the course, and that's great. We're going to get to those in a few minutes, but I want to make sure while we're on the topic of learning Docker, learning yeah. DevOps, that we uh, we get to those. So uh, feel free if you see one before me. Yeah, fagner has got one. Um, uh, Ray, for those not from the USA, what's the best, past, best path to get DevOps certification? Uh, I'm not... Um, well, I, DevOps certification, there's... there's there's a handful, right? I mean, there's um, you can be the DCA, like Docker Certified Associate. Um, I don't really know any off any more offhand, um, just because, like I said, I'm kind of taking in the big picture of everything instead of getting too um, specialized. But uh, do you know of any specific uh, DevOps certs? Yeah, so th I'd say that there are two types of certifications. There's certifications in a technology or tool um, that will claim that they're a DevOps cert or they're part of the, and they're not, right? Because it, no one tool is DevOps. So um, I would say that in a job, you're going to need certifications, especially at the beginning of your career. Uh, I kind of stopped once I got past 30 certifications. Uh, yeah. Once you have, when you don't have any, or maybe you're like me and you didn't have a college background, so you have nothing to show for it. You, you have to work really hard early on. That's what I did. I was actually in Italy taking Microsoft certifications on an Italian keyboard. That was a lot of fun, um, which is very similar to the U.S. keyboard, but a few important keys were different. Um, yeah, the and spaghetti key. <laughs> the spaghetti <laughs> The meatballs. Um, so, uh, no, I lost my train of thought. Oh, um, so there's those, right? So there, obviously you have, you have Kubernetes certifications. There's at least two of those. There's uh, cloud certifications. There's the Docker DCA certification. Of course, when people take Docker Mastery, the DCA is probably the top of their mind. Um so there's those, and I would say you're taking those as you're learning each tool, right? Um, yeah. It's not as important on those, I think, to get them all. Uh, it's it's not um, – it's um, – what's the little balls? What's the cartoon? Catch them all? What, what are we Pokemon? Pokemon. <laughs> it's not like Pokemon. <laughs> It's not, it's, you're not. It's not your job to catch them all. Uh, although I, there are I was people, not that, on, you were not on. Point. I was not thinking Pokemon when you were when you were first describing that. I'm thinking, uh, I have no idea what this guy is talking Where about is here. <laughs> we're talking DevOps. We're those little, what are you talking about? Those little balls. Um, yeah. So the 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 other part of this is the DevOps mindset and uh, process, right? So I would say. If you're truly looking for a company that knows what DevOps is. So here's part of the problem. You're going to see a lot of jobs where they don't really know what DevOps is. They just know they want someone to manage their CI CD solution and they just put DevOps in the title. So that may not really be, you know, that's that's a job to run a tool and you, you are expected to understand the DevOps mindset. Uh, so I would say there are certifications out there. One that comes to mind is the DevOps Institute. So you can look up that stuff. They talk about, um, they have something, I'm just looking at their website here, um, you know, DevOps Foundation certifications, uh, DevSecOps, which is a, a, rel a, a newer term than DevOps is DevSecOps, where you have a security engineer's mindset, but you're trying to live in a world of this dev and ops continually integrating and constantly updating and moving things rapidly and things are all automated. Um, so how do you apply security to that when the robots are essentially automating everything for you? 
And so there's a, they have a lot of stuff there. I'm sure that um, there are other ones out there. I have none of these official sort of higher level credentials. Um, I Since I capped out, after a couple of decades of working in the industry and having a ton of experience and certifications, you tend to not need the certifications anymore. So people don't tend, people look at you and your referrals, right? They look at your, yeah. your, what your background experience is and what clients you had. And they, you know, they talk to your referral, stuff like that. So I'm lucky that way. I didn't yeah. have to do that. But if you're starting out, um, those are probably more important for you. So I would focus on ones that are pl- technology agnostic first, because then you're going to really understand the methodology of why you're learning these tools. What is it even for? And do I, are those really that important? And I think a lot of people struggle with, do I go learn Docker first or do I go certify on AWS first? And um, I posted a link a couple minutes ago, which was how to be, you know, I'm, a question that I get in the GitHub AMA that we run um, is, you know, I let's say I'm coming from a DevOps background or any background that's not DevOps, how do I become better at that? And I throw in several answers. Uh, none of them are perfect. And I give you different opinions on different things. But in general, once you have the mindset down and you go after tools, I would say getting a, oper- you know, think of it from the bottom up. Maybe get a cloud certification of some sort with whatever cloud vendor you want to pick first. There is no wrong answer. AWS will get you the most mileage on a certification from them. But if you're in a company that's using Azure all day long, then you want to go for a Microsoft certification. And then once you've got the cloud, which is your infrastructure, then you maybe consider an OS certification, like Linux or Windows, depending on your focus. Uh, just pick one of those. Don't try to do both all at the same time. And then do look at the next layer, which is maybe containers, and pick a certification there, maybe either the Docker one or the Kubernetes ones. Um, uh, and then you work up the ladder, like maybe CI, CD, maybe orchestration, um, which I guess would be Kubernetes or OpenShift, something like that from Red Hat. So you're working your way up that ladder because if you start out, if Docker is your first cert and you have nothing, no fundamentals below that, you're not going to know necessarily the right patterns for applying that knowledge, uh, that Docker knowledge you just gained. So it's not going to be a waste of time. It's just going to be harder, I think. But yeah. that's just me. That's how I learn, I, I, I think. Um, we all learn a little bit different. So what do you think? Yeah. Uh, well, and, and then to get to the other part of his question where he says, for those not from the USA, so I'm not sure geographically where you are, but um, a lot of these uh, certs are, you know, available to, to take online, whether they have like uh, a remote proctor where somebody watches you to make sure you're not, <laughs> I've had a couple tests like that and stuff like that. But uh, uh, but yeah, no, I agree. I think, uh, I think picking something baseline first, um, will definitely help you, like I said, understanding the, uh, and even if it's not a certification, just taking any course to, to uh, get a baseline of what you want to learn. I mean, that'll, that'll, uh, that'll help you pick. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to drop, you know, a lot of these certifications can, can get pricey. You don't want to spend a ton of money and kind of limit yourself to one career path if you don't even like what you're doing. So, um, start base level and, uh, and find out what you want. And, uh, and then from there you can see, um, like I said, if you're limited geographically to one specific area that doesn't have, um, you know, on-site classes or certifications, then uh, find something that offers virtual, a virtual online cert uh, from there after you find out what you like. So that's yeah. my that, that's my recommendation. Yeah. Um, there's some great conversation that was in chat a few minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, people actually solving problems. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Casey uh, reminds us that many public libraries have uh, access to lynda.com. So this is uh, a super cool thing that I am guilty of not taking as advantage of as I should, which is uh, back in the day, decades ago, I used to go to public libraries to get the way we learned back before Google was these big, gigantic books like TCP IP Unleashed and stuff like that. And they would be huge, and it would take you, you know, forever. I'd have to check out the book multiple times because I could never read it in the two weeks or whatever they would give me. Um, so now the libraries are trying to stay, you know, stay relevant. So they may have uh, their own training platform, or they may just be partnering with Linda, or which is LinkedIn. Linda and LinkedIn are the same thing, or Udemy, or some other platform where uh, you can basically get these courses for free, which is awesome. And uh, yeah. I should be highlighting that more. In fact. Random thought off the top of my head: Is there a website to go check 
all libraries. Like, you know, yeah. if I live in Virginia Beach, I would have to go to find my yeah. library and find their stuff. But is there a site that's like, could I go to Linda and they list a site of all the libraries you could go to? <laughs> that could be the next uh, Code for America project. Mm. Yeah, that would be, yeah, yeah for learning. That's, um, a, that's a great point. I'll tell you what, um, I, you know, I know I'm kind of, uh, I'm not really speaking to the the broad sense of, the whole audience, but, uh, specifically in Hampton roads. Um, well, I, I, I assume that I hope that nationwide more libraries are adopting this, but, uh, in Norfolk, they have the new, um, Slover public library and it's, I say new, but, uh, it's newly renovated and their entire focus has been on being cutting edge, um, technology wise. And, and this is the first public library that I knew of, uh, possibly in all of Hampton roads that they have like, free use um uh 3d printers like that's that's something you can just go play with uh they have like linda is uh is on um they have like they got like generic linda accounts for uh for all the computers there mm. they've got um you know servers you can connect to they've got they had raspberry Pis you could play with um and it's like you know i'm hoping that more libraries adopt this like hey books aren't the only way people are learning anymore <laughs> Let's uh, let's try and be a little bit more proactive on helping people advance themselves because that's at the end of the day that was what you know libraries were were there for is to help people kind of expand their knowledge and and if there's different types of learning now then they got to keep up too so uh, I hope that more companies adopt it I gotta yeah shut my, you know, it's starting to rain hang on one yeah. moment yeah yeah <laughs> uh, so th I think that's what we're gonna do this again by the way so thanks so, so much for if you're on the show but uh watching live but we're gonna definitely do this again and i think next time we'll yeah. we'll put together some resources uh i know like i have my favorite newsletters uh there's you know obviously the, the courses that ray has taken that he likes and doesn't like i don't know if he has a, a do not buy list but we can <laughs> we can work on that um of course we'll probably i'll probably put out um a, a call to you all since a lot of you are either in devops or learning devops and so if you're on my newsletter, I will put that on the newsletter to ask for your feedback on that. So feel free to tweet us at the – the – Yeah, boy. That one over there. <laughs> uh, so uh, those are our Twitter handles. Uh, feel free to tweet us any recommendations of either things you like or things you think suck and uh, – or, you know, could be better uh, yeah. if I want to be nice because I, I, I like people to be nice. <laughs> Um, and that we'll certainly put something like that together. I think uh, off the top of my head, Absolutely. there's a guy, Chris Short, who is a CFC and CNCF ambassador, um, who has a DevOps ish newsletter. I think it's one of my favorites. Uh, he's, he's got a nice, quirky, opinionated view, and he focuses, which is nice, on people and process before tools. So his, his newsletter is weekly on Sundays, and it's very long, and he always uh, gives commentary on stuff. And it's a great viewpoint. I don't always agree with everything he says, but that's fine. That's The thing about a lot of this is we're all trying to navigate our way, and there's a thousand ways to do most things. So um, yeah. it's, it's a great uh, – I'm just glad he's doing it, and I hope he keeps it up because uh, I think the community really appreciates it. There's lots of other yeah. stuff out there that we'll be putting into a, a show maybe in the future uh, yeah. here pretty soon. Yeah. So yeah, if you uh, check out in the links in the chat, it's uh, chrisshort.net slash newsletter. Um, and yeah. uh, what we were just talking about too before uh, before we went live was like this wave of uh, of everyone being on Twitter, and like it's not just you know like hey, there's a funny video of a guy falling off a motorcycle. Let's put that on Twitter. It's not just that anymore. So it's like people, uh, not just blogs that you need to follow or. Or courses you need to take but sometimes it's just as simple as a good account on twitter that you should follow because they in 140 characters they you know have some good ideas and some good thoughts on stuff so um we'll definitely i'm going to definitely be keeping an eye out on um on some stuff that we can uh that we can include on that next next time like you're talking about yeah i think if you're definitely wanting to get into the social aspect of of um uh if of DevOps, if, if you learn from social media, if that's one of the ways you get your news and stuff like that, <clears throat> I think Twitter is probably the best place to be, at least uh, from my viewpoint. I think Facebook and LinkedIn obviously have their own little communities, but it seems uh, a lot of times they seem like walled gardens a little bit. And Twitter is yeah. just you know completely open. Uh, you don't have to like join a group or be invited to something or anything. You can just 
find one person and then follow their feed, and then you'll eventually find other people that you follow, and eventually, um, you, before you know it, you've, you're following 500 people that have something to do with DevOps. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Um, that's how I started, and I think now it's, it is the place for me to go. Uh, not, not only that, but if you go to conferences, you meet people and you see those people at the same conference usually, and you end yeah. up actually getting friends. And it's that's like the reason to go to conferences nowadays because you can always watch the videos online. You don't have yeah. to go. And so I go for the people, and I get to see those people that I've been tweeting with for a long time. Yeah. And it's always great. Yeah. So you're, uh, it's like you're at a conference and you bump into somebody. And you're like, hey, you're... At Noobmaster69, it's you in person, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> in the flesh. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, and it's always hard when the person doesn't have their their current photo, uh, yeah. as their, uh, so you don't know what they look like, or they catfish. Their picture, they're, they're totally different. <laughs> yeah, exactly, catfish. The the uh, I for a couple of years there, I was like shaving my beard, and I had a beard and I didn't have a beard or I had long hair that had short hair, whatever. And, uh, I would see this one person every year, I think. And every time I saw them, I had a completely different look. Like I changed my glasses to black rim, whatever. And they're like, you're, <laughs> you're like, where's Waldo? Yeah. Like, <laughs> uh, it yeah. was funny. I don't do that anymore, but yeah, you got it. You've got a, uh, you've got an image to uphold now. That's right. Gotta, That's right. I got to keep the look so people recognize me. Yeah, you um, got to wear black frame glasses for the rest of your life, when, unfortunately. When, <laughs> when I introduce myself to everyone, I always do this. Remember me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, hold my glasses like my uh, yeah. my random bar yeah. picture that's ended up as my standard online uh, yeah. uh, emoji. Um, yeah. So, all right. So we're going to take some questions now from the audience uh, and wrap this up. So we're, what we're going to do is we're going to jump in. In case you're not aware and you're new to this show, uh, every week I try to help students and now I've got Ray with me to help too because he's in the chat every day helping you with Q&A and the courses. We've now got three courses working on the fourth for Kubernetes and uh, we've got, by the way, we've been teasing out that uh, there's going to be some updates here. Uh, hopefully this month we expect to release some new, this month to Docker Mastery. So if you're a Docker Mastery student, expect to see some emails from Udemy or on my newsletter bredfisher.com slash newsletter. You can get it at that URL up there. Um, you'll know the day that those launch because uh, we're going to be adding several new sections of new stuff into Docker Mastery on Kubernetes. So continued, continued benefits for that small price you paid for that, that course online. So um, first up, so these are some uh, technical questions not necessarily related to learning DevOps. We're shifting focus a little bit. Um, uh, let's see, we got a first question up. What is the best strategy to delay your containers in order to keep them on a specific order like doing DB, web, rabbit, and so on? So the number one thing is, and this isn't even a DevOps thing, this is a distributed computing thing, is that it, I'm assuming you're talking about production, not local development workflow with something like Docker Compose. But if you're talking about production, all your apps have to be able to fail or retry. So the entire, like whether or not this is before Docker, basically whatever you're using there, it has to recover in some fashion from not being able to talk to other services outside of its own. And this is a core principle of distributed computing. In fact, if you look up um, what a resource would be here is 12factor. 12factor.net is sort of, it's a decade old set of principles around the mindset of cloud native and distributed computing. Those are two different but similar types of things that uh, really it's about if I've got a bunch of servers or a bunch of things that my servers have to talk to, how do I or orchestrate all of those to be available when they're needing to be available? And the answer is you can't control startup, right? Because startup is only part of the problem. When you have to replace a container, if the other containers lose connection from it because a container or any other service goes down for a second, all those other services that are using it have to be able to recover. And so uh, unlike the old days where we had a single server and we put, you know, like the database and the website on the same server and that was always available and online um, until it went down, th that was easy. But now in this world where you have distributed computing, your containers and all of your services have to take that in mind. So they either need to have a retry, which if you're doing development, most um, develop sorry, most database drivers all have built-in retry designed in them. So they will actually retry to, you know, like MongoDB and Node.js actually even has a buffer protocol where it, if it can't connect, it'll hold the commands 
for a little bit to wait for the database to come back online. It's, it's just built into the driver uh, for your development language. So there's lots of stuff out there like that. And if, if your app doesn't do anything like that, then and it just fails, the nice thing if you're using container orchestration is that part of that job of that orchestrator is if the container just crashes because it loses connection from something, then the orchestrator will restart, will basically start a new copy of that somewhere else. And that's one way to recover from failure. It's a little bit cleaner and um, less taxing on your systems if they just retry. But another way in Docker to do it is to just let your apps crash, essentially. And um, if then Docker will restart them based on your settings. So I know that's probably not the little click button answer. A lot of people might just answer, oh, you need to add retry to your Docker Compose or something. But that's not a production solution because it only has to do that only has to do with original startup. And if you even Google for something like wait for it scripts, uh, those don't really solve the whole problem either because you're going to, one of the things is if you're going to start using containers, you're going to be updating them more often. That's part of the progress of implementing the DevOps mindset is things are going to be updated more often than they were in the past because that's one of the core tenets of DevOps is continually evolving and improving. So, uh, when you start doing that, that means that any one piece of your puzzle has to be able to handle any other piece of the puzzle going down. And you can't really do that with startup order, if you know what I mean. Hopefully that helps. Um, it's, it's a tough problem to solve if you're dealing with legacy apps, but uh, it's a continu- <laughs> you have to continually work on continuing uh, on the process of getting your apps to all handle failure, essentially. It's, it's not an easy problem, and it, it's, a, it's a process to go through. Um, when splitting microservices between separate repos, would it be best to maintain a deploy repo or ensure each repo is independent and maintains its own deployment details? So I think there's no fast uh, answer for this. Um, there's no right or wrong. It's really about the size of your team, the amount of repos you're talking about, the you know the maturity of your your workflow. And so if you've got a bunch of automated tools and everything is well automated and basically when you do a commit to your software repo in Git or whatever and everything automatically deploys, well, that's a really automated, easy workflow. So splitting things up is fine. Like you could split it up to, as, to your heart's content. But if you're just one person and you don't want a lot of overhead, a lot of extra work, then you're going to want to keep as few as possible just for simplicity of administration and management, right? So uh, I would say that I've worked with teams where they have their own deploy repo, and that's everything from a bunch of YAML files to maybe some some shell scripts or things like that. Maybe it's some CI/CD YAML, maybe it's Kubernetes YAML, maybe it's also some Docker Compose YAML. All that stuff's in that separate repo. But I've also seen teams that they have a more simplified infrastructure where maybe they're just deploying a single set, a single solution that's multiple containers. And so they just pick one of those repos. Maybe it's the web front end or whatever. And they put their YAML files and their deployment scripts in that. And then everything else just has a Docker file. So they might have like three repos, one for the API, one for the web front end, and one for the database stuff. And the web, they just pick the web front end as the place to put it, right? They don't make a whole separate repo just for a couple of files, right? If they don't have a lot of complexity. But as your complexity grows, you're going to need to split things out more and more. The goal there is that you're keeping things flexible so that you can split things out in the future and it won't completely break all your stuff, right? That you'll, yeah. So keep that in mind. Keep it, start simple, grow, you know, split it out as you grow, and hopefully uh, it won't be too much work. Because one of the things I, I don't want to see people do is split out everything all over the place for no good reason. And then they're, you know, they're one person and they're suddenly burdened with the job of managing dozens of repos for their, you know, side project or for, you know, they're the single DevOps person in the company and it's not even their full-time job. And now they got all this work to do because they have all these repos. So it's a great question. Uh, Ray, you see any good ones? Let's see here. Well, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, talking back and forth between uh, John and Fagner, trying to fix, uh, uh, or trying to go through what he's got going on. I like seeing that. Um, yeah, this good point here about uh, using Compose in development and production should be Swarm or or Kubernetes or ECS or something else, or just plain old Docker if you don't want to use orchestration. But yeah, com- a reminder: Docker Compose, the command line tool, is meant really for the local development workflow. You can use it on a server. Because it will run, right? It functions, but 
it's not designed for that. That was not r- part of the original scope of the tool. Um, you know, uh, we all sometimes use tools not the way they're intended. Uh, so I definitely would say that people sometimes look at Docker Compose and they try to fill out that YAML for Docker Compose to make it act like a server in, t- in terms of always setting, you know, setting always to restart and putting in wait for its scripts and depends on. And that's all stuff designed for local development. When you start to try to use that stuff on Docker Compose in production, you'll find that you still can't prevent downtime with Compose because it wasn't designed for that. It doesn't do health checks. It, there's a, excuse me. It's, it's, it does a lot of things that are um, not really focused on production. Yeah, we'll take that out before we put that in the podcast. Yeah, no, I think it should be uh, <laughs> part of it. Yeah, I think uh, when we do happy hour, that's definitely appropriate. By the way, if go. you're looking for a funny podcast <laughs> random, uh, Your Mom's House podcast is my favorite comedian podcast right now. So uh, just YouTube, Your Mom's House. It's a funny time. Uh, it's a specific type of humor. You may not <laughs> agree with it, but uh, their their job on the show is to uh, make all bodily noises and the microphone. So, apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I have a separate micro. Okay, that's not a question. That's <laughs> are you using individual bikers in the building. Uh oh. Um. I think we've answered them all. I, I don't see anything here. Um, he also is kind of talking. Yeah, that's that's awesome. People are down the rabbit hole of solving problems. I never yeah. thought about us actually solving problems in YouTube chat, but it's yeah. happening. Yeah. Um, Sharing. I'm telling you. Thanks, the Charlie. Whole- I, I put Charlie's up there. He had some good comments I put up there about wine and... I'm a bourbon fan, so we should just do a bourbon show. <laughs> like, by the way, uh, a bourbon podcast run by someone who used to run the Rex Ray Project. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick. Since, there, since there's a, a bourbon fan on the on the call, let's see if I can. Um, is it the? And he's, I mean, he's like in Kentucky, so that's like, yeah, I mean, that's like, a, that's a real fan right there. Yeah, that's yeah, the real deal. That's like uh, like me with my rum down here. You know, it's like I got ten different types over there that I'm looking at. Not necessarily a connoisseur, but you know, when in Rome, I had to eat some pasta. Yeah, it might be it might be the bourbon pursuit. Um, I'm not sure if that's the right one. I don't think I don't actually think that's the right one. Anyway, uh, I can't. I don't have uh, the ability to find it um, quickly. Um, anyway, there's uh, there's actually someone in the DevOps space that runs one of the best bourbon podcasts. So um, I will have to find that and post that later on Twitter. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it, it's bourbon night. It's bourbon night. That's what Charlie says. Is that possible that that's the one? It's bourbon night. Uh, is that a podcast, Charlie? I'm not sure what uh, what you're saying there. It's worth a Google. Let's see. That's a, uh, yeah, that's a. Yeah, it's Bourbon it's, Pursuit. It's Kenny Coleman. So uh, bourbonpursuit.com um, is the podcast. And uh, and uh, Kenny Coleman, who uh, used to work at EMC Dell, and I'm not sure, uh, I think he's at VMware now. I'm not sure really where he's at now. Um but he he has the Bourbon Pursuit podcast, and so it's you know there's a lot of people in tech that like whiskey and various forms of whiskey, including bourbon and scotch, 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 scotch. All right, so we're gonna <laughs> down in my belly, down in my belly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so all right, so we're gonna wrap this up because I think uh, we have answered all the great questions today, and people are ready to move on with the rest of their workday or their evening, if depending on where they are in the world, or their coffee in the morning. So, uh, as always, you can find us and all my resources at brettfisher.com slash docker right there. We'll be back here next Thursday at the same time, and we will definitely do a future show with Ray where we talk more about learning DevOps and give away some DevOps resources. 
And next week, we're going to have Solo IO on the call. So we're going to be learning about service mesh and troubleshooting in Docker containers and in orchestration and doing things like uh, distributed tracing. And if you know, don't know anything about service mesh, we're going to talk about that as well. So that's going to be a great time. Uh, with Betty on the call, and I hope you show up next week here on YouTube Live. Until then, I'll see you on the internet. Bye. Bye.